Hello everybody, this is Dr. Pennington again. I am going to be talking in this video about constant pressure calorimetry as I referenced in the last video um, that I put up about comparing internal energy to enthalpy. Enthalpy is going to be the ultimate focus of this video because what we're going to do, what constant pressure calorimetry is for, as I mentioned in the last video, is to determine the enthalpy change for a particular reaction. That's usually shown as delta H R X N, just R X N short for reaction. The actual experimental setup that we have here is what you'll see in lab. We have a stir plate, we have a styrofoam cup with a lid stir a bar in there, we've got some solution, it's just water, and in there we put our reagents, and those reagents are in this case sodium hydroxide and HCl. What we usually do is we have our solution of HCl that we pop in there, we weigh out the sodium hydroxide and dump it in, stir it up, and make sure that we put the lid on as quickly as possible, stick in the temperature probe um, that's hooked up to the vernier unit that we've used before, and we just monitor the temperature. All right? And either the temperature goes up or down, depending on the reaction. This reaction in this case happens to be exothermic, so energy goes from the reagents to the water, so the water heats up. You remember exothermic means energy is given out, in this case from the reagents to uh, the water. The reagents are the system, the water is the surroundings. Okay. So in order for us to calculate this delta rate of reaction, one of the things that we saw before um, in our previous video is that in order to get the delta rate of reaction, we need the heat exchange. All right. And we saw this last time. The Q for the reaction is essentially the, the heat involved during the reaction, hence uh, which, which is determined by the temperature change. Now, in order for us to determine that, there's a particular formula that we need to be able to uh, calculate that. And that formula is equal to, so Q of reaction is equal to M times C times delta T. All right, now specifically M is the mass of the solvent, the mass that the reagents are giving their heat up to. All right, because Essentially, the mass of the water, the water is what's being is is what's being given to. Uh, oh, sorry, let me start again. The water is where the heat is going. So the amount of water actually determines uh, the amount of heat that the temperature probe is going to measure. There is also the delta T, which of course is the temperature difference. You'll have your initial temperature. Then you have your final temperature. So for an exothermic reaction like this, the final is going to be higher than the initial. And then we have the C as well. C is uh, called a specific heat capacity. Every pure substance has its own value of C. The units of it are joules per gram per degree C. And essentially what this is a measure of is how much energy do you have to put into something to make it hot? All right. The analogy here is when you are cooking at home, you're boiling some water, doing some technical cooking there, you have some eggs going and boiling the hell out of that water, and you want to stir up the eggs. Well, you have a couple of choices about what to do. You can stick your fingers in, if you want to, or you can use a wooden spoon, plastic spoon, or say uh, an aluminium spoon. Um, I imagine that you go for the wooden spoon simply because you know it doesn't get hot very easily. The idea being that the wood has a very high value of its heat capacity, meaning it takes a high number of joules to heat it up. Aluminum or aluminium, on the other hand, has a very low uh, specific heat capacity, meaning it doesn't take much energy at all to heat it up. That's why when you make a cup of tea or coffee and you leave your spoon in there for a while, it gets really hot really quickly because most metals have very low values of specific heat capacity. So what it really means is how much energy does it take to raise one gram of my substance by one degree C? So the lower the number of joules, the easier it is to raise that one gram by one degree C. Thus, the solvent we're using here is water. And it turns out that it takes 4.18 joules to raise one gram of water by one degree C. And so this is a value we are going to be using. 
That's going to be a constant. All right. So the two variables here are essentially the mass of the water and then the delta t. Delta t, of course, is what we're going to measure. The mass we will have pre-measured. So, um, and then you just run it, get your data, and convert it to delta h. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But how about we go through an actual example involving a slightly different reaction. So let's just take a look at that. What about if we took some magnesium, added it into HCl, and got the two products that we have here, magnesium chloride and hydrogen gas? One thing you always want to be careful about when you're running a reaction like this is you have to make sure your equation is correctly balanced. Two chlorines, one chlorine. Two hydrogens, one hydrogen. So now it's balanced, and that does make a difference. And we're given this data. We have 0.158 grams of magnesium, and that's added into 100 mils of water. We set up the calorimeter like we have here. Monitor the temperature change. Again, we're going to have an exothermic reaction in this case. Our initial temperature is 25.6 degrees. Our final temperature is 32.8. The density of our solution is 1 gram per mil. We need that because we're given a volume of our solution. This is the density of it. And we need the mass. Hence why the density is there. So let's go ahead and calculate the Q for the solution. Okay. If the volume of the solution is 1 gram per is 100 mils and the density is 1 gram per mil, that means our mass is 100 grams. Simple enough. We're going to assume that this is just water, so we're going to use the specific heat capacity for water, which we said before was 4.18 joules per gram per degree C. 4.18 joules per gram per degree C. Notice grams on the top, grams on the bottom. Um, delta T, 32.8 minus 25.6, I think everybody would agree it ends up being 7.2 degree C. All right. 7.2 degrees C. Now before we go any further, let's just check. This is an energy term, so we want units of energy left. The only energy term here is joules, so everything else should cancel out grams, degree C. All right, cool. Everything else cancels, so we're left with joules. Lovely. So let's go and calculate the Q for the solution, which ends up being 3.0 times 10 to the third joules. All right. Now, we are being asked to calculate the enthalpy change for the reaction, which means we need the heat exchanged in terms of the reaction. We have here the heat exchanged in terms of the solution, so what this means is this is the heat that was picked up by the water, and we don't want that. We want the heat that was given up by the reactants. Okay. There's actually a very simple reaction, a very simple equation that that links these two. If this energy was picked up by the water, then it must be the same amount of energy that was given up by the reactants. Okay. This is positive because the water heated up. The energy went into the water, the heat went into the water. If the heat went into the water, it must have come out of the reagents. So if this is positive, the Q for the reaction must be negative. Now what this means is the relationship between these two is this, and this is always the case. The energy change or the heat transfer for the solution is always opposite in sign to the heat transfer for the reaction, assuming you have a perfectly insulated system, which you never do, but we're just going to assume that we do. So therefore, the uh, the heat transfer in terms of our reaction is just going to be the negative sign of that, which is 3.0 times 10 to the third joules. Now that makes sense because this is an exothermic reaction. You expect that to be negative. All right. So we have one more step, and that is to get from the Q for the reaction to the delta H. And the only change we have to make here is simply based on the fact that this has different units to this. This is in units of joules. Enthalpy changes are usually reported in units of kilojoules per mole. All right. 
And this is per mole of reagents, things that are reacting. All right. In this case, we're given the amount of magnesium. That is what we're going to use. So in order for us to calculate the delta H of the reaction here, we've got to convert the joules to kilojoules. We've got to find out the moles of our magnesium and just get the answer that way. All right. So the, the process here, three steps. Number one, we always find Q for the solution, which is what we've already done. Step two, the next thing we do is find Q for the reaction, which in this case, lucky us, again, we have already done. And from that, we find delta H of reaction. This we have not done yet. So, we're going to do exactly what we just said we had to do here. So the first thing we need is to find the number of moles of magnesium. We said on the last slide we had 0.158 grams of magnesium. We're going to convert that into moles by knowing that one mole of magnesium weighs 24.31 grams of magnesium. That just comes directly from the periodic table, giving us 0 0.0065 moles of magnesium or 6.5 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of mg. All right, that's our number of moles. So to get our delta H of reaction, we're going to take our number of joules, which we know is 3.0 times 10 to the third joules. Remember, that's a negative sign there. We're going to divide that by the number of moles that we just calculated. 6.5 times 10 to the negative 3 moles of magnesium. And then the only other thing is to make sure that we convert from joules to kilojoules. So we know that in one kilojoule, we have 1,000 joules. So hopefully, if we've done everything right, we should be left with kilojoules per mole, and that's what we are left with because the joules cancel out. When we do that, the answer that we're left with is still negative because it's still exothermic, which is fine. Negative 4.65 times 10 to the second kilojoules per mole. And that is how you calculate the enthalpy of reaction using constant pressure calorimetry. We're going to do this in lab. You'll get to actually do it, and this is the calculation that you'll do at the end. You can see it's not really that involved. It's much less complex than it looks. It's really not too bad. All right? Thank you.